If you cast your minds back to the last episode in this series of Le Mot d'Arthur, you might remember our Greenhorn hero, Sir Grifflet, riding off into the forests with delusions of grandeur. His intentions were to face off against the mysterious knight who had ambushed and killed Sir Miles, and whilst many were keen to take this as warning enough to leave the mysterious knight alone, Sir Grifflet, in his youthful mind, wanted vengeance and believed he had the means to deliver it. Of course, after encountering the mysterious knight, who author Howard Pyle refers to as the Sable Knight, Grifflet gets his ass kicked and is sent back to the kingdom bruised, battered, and ultimately embarrassed. During this time, we learn from Limot the Arthur that things are just as tense in Arthur's court. It would appear that 12 knights from the Roman Empire appeared before him and demand that he concede his realm and his lands to the Roman Emperor, lest he be destroyed by their military juggernaut. Upon hearing this, Arthur gives a pretty ballsy response, as he tells them that he won't concede anything and that if the Emperor wants his land so badly, then he should come himself, and that if he does, Arthur will fight him one on one. With this, the knights from the Roman Empire take their leave, and not a moment too soon either, for Sir Griffler is rushed into the court, bloody and beaten. Once more, we have here another interaction of Arthur starting to stand on his own two feet, at last. The Arthur from the first two chapters would have likely have needed Merlin's opinion first, or better yet, to have Merlin speak for him. On this occasion though, he speaks for himself and his country, and is able to send the knights fleeing with their tails between their legs. You might remember the last time Arthur had to speak before those who questioned his rule, and that this required direct intervention by Merlin. To be honest, Merlin probably wrote the script for him. Here though, Arthur appears to be far more with it, and doesn't hesitate with his dismissal. The dismissal of the Roman Empire, no less. Arthur's attention though is quickly hijacked by the state of Sir Grifflet. Given that he'd been beaten within an inch of his life, you might say that Arthur felt partially responsible. After all, it was he who had made Sir Grifflet a knight, despite the cautions by Merlin, and it was he who gave his blessing for Grifflet to go and face the Sable Knight, despite knowing how fearsome the knight was, given what he'd done to Sir Miles. His guilty feeling becomes obvious here, as he orders Sir Grifflet to be homed in his own chambers to recover. This shows us an interesting duality of Arthur's character that we come to appreciate more and more. In that one moment, he was standing firm to the invaders and telling them to bugger off home, and the next, he is fretting over his friend. As the text seeks to constantly reiterate, Arthur is not just a mighty king who can fight, but he's also a just and kind king, one who cares deeply about his acquaintances. It's clear to see that power and riches have not gone to Arthur's head, and that the boy who was keen to please his stepfather and stepbrother in Sir Ector and Sir Kay is still somewhere in there, compassionate and good-natured. We then see him summoned for his best armours and his best horse, for he intends to go and fight the Sable Knight himself, so as to bring him to justice for the terror and pain he has caused. Once more, Arthur's sense of honour and morality rings through here, for he does not hesitate in doing that which he knows he must do. Many would have considered the beating that Sir Miles and Sir Grifflet had endured and shied away from such a conflict, but Arthur welcomes it and appears to be eager to face the Sable Knight. It's clear he wants to avenge his friend and do the right thing, but it's also possible that he wants to take down the Sable Knight so that he cannot harm anyone ever again. With this in mind, Arthur demonstrates how selfless he can be in that he, a king, is willing to put himself in harm's way something that we've seen him do many times already. You might also say that Arthur is playing into a possible rush of adrenaline, and that this high life of fighting and winning honour becomes addictive to him. We know that he can be bloodthirsty. We've seen him had to be called off by Merlin before, and so it does lead me to wonder whether Arthur is beginning to feed a hero complex. In any case, he wastes no time on his journey and probably would have gone straight for the Sable Knight without stopping. But he happens to stumble upon Merlin, who appears to be chased by a group of men. Le Mort d'Arthur does not identify these men, nor details why they had it in for Merlin, but it does say that they intend to kill him. Merlin, for all his scheming ways, appears to be running away. 
so much for being the Grand Wizard, right? In fact, Le Mort d'Arthur appears to imply that had these men gotten a hold of Merlin, they would have indeed killed him. Luckily for him though, Arthur emerges just in time, and chases the assailants away. Arthur cheekily remarks that for all of Merlin's magical powers, he would have been slain had it not been for him passing by. Now, if we know Arthur at all, he probably meant this as more as a light-hearted observation than a spiteful jab. But of course, Merlin with his inflatable ego cannot handle such a slight, and proceeds to contradict not only Arthur, but the narration of Le Mort the Arthur itself, saying, I could save myself, and I would, and thou art more near thy death than I am. For thou goest to the death ward, and God be not thy friend. Talk about bringing a gun to a knife fight. He not only comes across as ungrateful for Arthur's help, but also totally disingenuous. Despite having been chased and cornered by these three men, he refuses to admit that he was in trouble, and sticks to his story that he could have defeated them and would have done so had Arthur not shown up. Furthermore, he shows how bruised his ego is as he attacks Arthur, saying that he is going to die first, and that he should be more worried about that than about how he saved his life. It makes me wonder whether Merlin is actually that powerful, beyond scheming and manipulation. We know manipulation is one craft he's a master of, but with the exception of producing the sword in the stone and transforming the image of Uther Pendragon into the Duke of Tintagil, we haven't seen Merlin do any magic of the offensive kind. All of his tricks appear to be just that, tricks or illusions. As of this stage, we are yet to see him even try a cheeky fireball. Either he's holding out on us, or he really isn't such a grand wizard after all. As well as getting defensive after Arthur's remark, he also proceeds to tell him that God is not on his side in this endeavour of fighting the Sable Knight, and as ever supportive, tells Arthur that he is going to die if he proceeds on this course of action. Arthur appears to ignore Merlin's words however, once more proving that the old man's mutterings are having less and less of an effect on him. Perhaps you might say that Merlin is beginning to lose his hold over Arthur, and that the leash that was once tight is slowly starting to loosen, especially after Arthur had witnessed Merlin stumbling about and failing to defend himself against the attackers. We are then told that Arthur and Merlin come to a fountain whereby a rich pavilion stands, the very same area where Sir Grifflet had beckoned the Sable Knight. It is here they find that very same knight seated in a chair, just chilling out and minding his own business. But we do learn here that the reason why this Sable Knight is out here is because he is serving as some kind of enforcer for the route, and that payment to pass by him is a fight. Arthur implores him to abandon such a, well, hobby it would seem, but the knight declares that he will keep doing this until someone stops him. Sensing a challenge at hand, Arthur clashes with the knight. We are told that both men came at each other so aggressively that their spears cracked and splintered on each other. With that, Arthur pulled at his sword, and seemed keen to end the battle by blood. But the knight shows some restraint, and insists they use spears. Why he demands this is not known, but I get the feeling that despite his desire to hurt people, the Sable Knight doesn't wish to kill them. You'll notice that he has a moment of grief when he beats Sir Griffler, and was concerned he might have killed him, before sending him on his way. Had he used a sword against Arthur, it's possible that he might have won and slain him, thus getting blood on his hands that he would have rather done without. In any case, Arthur agrees to the use of spears, and we learn here that the Sable Knight has a squire who comes forth and arms both men with more spears. Yet again, the exact same thing happens. Both men appear to be equal jousters, for they break apart their weapons on each other, and are unable to dismount each other. Once more, Arthur goes for his sword, but again, the knight dissuades him, prompting for the squire to bring forth yet another pair of spears. This time the two knights go at each other, Arthur is dismounted. As we've seen in the past, dismounting an enemy off their horse appears to have been a great dishonour, and possibly even something of an omen, or a metaphor, for death itself. So you can imagine how much of a blow this must have been to Arthur, the king no less. Whilst he had set out to restore the honour of Sir Grifflet and bring the Sable Knight to justice, 
he'd ended up losing a part of his own honour and appeared to be no closer to bringing any justice to anyone. The words of Merlin suggesting that this conflict would have been his end would have surely been playing on his mind at this point, and it's likely that doubt was beginning to creep in. But far be it from Arthur to throw in the towel. Instead, he becomes even more volatile than we've ever seen him before, and once more draws his sword, demanding to end this with blood. Whilst he does acknowledge the jousting prowess of the knight, and admits defeat in this competition, he does not wish to surrender, and is certainly willing to up the stakes. Given that he showed the Sable Knight honour and gave him compliments, he was likely expecting the knight to do the same, and to honour his request, and fight with swords, and not spears. But instead, the Sable Knight merely declares, I will stay on my horse. Outraged by this, Arthur pretty much forces the knight to abide by the new rules of combat. He rushes the knight, which in turn causes the knight to dismount, and the two do indeed engage one another with swords. The Le Mort de Arthur tells us that the battle was intense, with many slashes and strokes, and that both men earned terrible cuts upon the other. In what appears to be a duel for the ages, the Sable Knight ends up striking Arthur's sword so hard that it breaks in two pieces. With this, the battle seems at its end, and the Sable Knight offers Arthur the chance to yield, having bested him in both the jousting skirmish and now in Arthur's own sword battle. But once more, Arthur shows his undying resolve in that he refuses to surrender, even with the battle so heavily weighed in the Sable Knight's favour. With no sword to hand, Arthur resorts to tackling the knight, and a fist fight ensues. You might say that Arthur dishonours himself in this, for the Sable Knight had offered Arthur the chance to yield, having beaten him fairly. This is more than he'd given Sir Miles or Sir Griffler, and so, it's possible, at the very least, Arthur had earned the knight's respect. But Arthur does not accept this, or more like, he won't accept it. He cannot bear the fact that he has been defeated, and so sprawls to the ground with the Sable Knight in a sloppy demonstration of rage. Even in this, however, the Sable Knight appears to get the better of Arthur, as he knocks him back, retrieves his sword, and goes to behead him. It seems likely that he would have done this too, had everyone's favourite meddler not gone in the way. Merlin demands that the Sable Knight let Arthur live, for if he takes his life, he will plunge the entire realm into its darkest days. Curious as to who this man even is, Merlin tells the Sable Knight that it is King Arthur. Before we even get to see the Sable Knight's reaction however, Merlin actually blasts the knight with a spell. Indeed, at long last, we see Merlin use some of that power that he'd earlier bragged about having. Perhaps then, he is not such a helpless old man after all, but instead someone who conserves his power and uses it only when he absolutely has to. Perhaps then, he was telling the truth about being able to deal with the attackers that Arthur had saved him from. The spell he uses puts the Sable Knight into a deep sleep, thus saving Arthur's life, and arguably the entire realm from suffering the loss of a king. By this, you might say that Merlin does actually have his moments of heroics, but after all the sordid stuff he's actually done in the story thus far, I'd say it's about damn time. After this, he manages to get Arthur onto a horse, and rides off with him to safety. Now upon waking from his defeat, Arthur is described as being wroth with anger. Like Merlin previously, he shows little gratitude for Merlin's intervention, and actually condemns him, saying that he shouldn't have used his magic, nor even tried to save his life, for it would have been better to have died with honour than to flee in the way that he had done. But Merlin pretty much tells him not to worry about it, implying that there are far greater things to earn and lose than honour over a fight in the forest. He also appears to console Arthur in a way, telling him that the Sable Knight was much bigger than him, older than him, and far more experienced. As you might imagine, this is very unlike Merlin to do, for he probably could care less about the state of Arthur's ego. He is quick nevertheless to return to his usual salty tone, telling Arthur that he told him not to go and fight him, and that none of this would have happened if he had just listened to him. He even appears to mock Arthur by telling him he would have died had it not been for his presence, similarly to how Arthur had said to him in the case of the men who had pursued Merlin. In this, 
it proves we can always underestimate Merlin's ability for pettiness. He does deliver one of his usual prophecies however, declaring that the Sable Knight will one day become an ally, and that he will have two sons, those who will be very good men, Percival of Wales and Lamerick of Wales. He also proceeds to reveal the identity of the Sable Knight, and that it is none other than King Pellinor, the very same king who had stolen Arthur's horse in his search of the questing beast. Merlin concludes that Pellinor will also tell Arthur the name of his own son, the very same son that he had conceived with his sister, as Merlin is keen to remind him, and that this boy will most certainly be the destruction of all the realm. In the next episode, we'll be looking at how Arthur heals from the loss to King Pellinor, and how he comes across a mighty sword, one that legends tell was known as Excalibur. As always guys, if you've enjoyed today's video, then don't forget to give it a like, and don't forget to subscribe for more content just like this. Until next time.